Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thanks to the organizing committee, Iman and uh, Emirate Medical Association, Internal Medicine Medical Association, for the invitation. It's a very interesting topic. It's big, it's massive, it's vast. So bear with me. I'm going to be going quick, especially through the introduction slides. So, um, first of all, as you know, mentioned earlier on by my colleagues, we have to agree on the definition of chronic kidney disease. So it's, it's the abnormalities of the kidney structure and or function for more than three months, uh, which uh, impl uh, have an implication on the patient health. This is seen in uh, the decrease in EJFR and or albuminuria as seen in blood test. The reason we do these things, the albumin and the urine albumin to creatinine ratio, it helps us to stratify patients according to the level of the EGFR and the quantity of protein into this nice heat map where we can divide them into low risk, moderate, high, or very high risk, which intensifies our therapy and hopefully also tailor our treatment and collaboration with other subspecialties as we see. Chronic kidney disease is a big problem. This poster is from the International Society of Nephrology and it was back in 2017 where we unfortunately have 800, 843 million people with kidney disease. That's a massive number, um, and that's approximately one in 10. And unfortunately, in 2040, as you see in the middle, it's expected to be the fifth leading cause of death. The concentration of this pandemic or this disease is gonna be in the Middle East, as you see on the right side from the slides. And the common causes are still the same, diabetes, hypertension, and so on. It's not only numbers, this is a serious problem because death due to cardiovascular disease occur in patients with chronic kidney disease 26% times more than death from kidney disease itself. So in other words, other word, most of the patients who have kidney disease die from cardiac vascular diseases before they get into dialysis or end up dying due to the underlying kidney disease. Now, when we earlier on discussed albumin to creatinine ratio and EGFR, that's also of significance because independently, each of those factors do carry a risk and do carry a morbidity to the patient. If you look at the right side of the slides, um, the presence of urine albumin to creatinine ratio doubles the risk of cardiac events. Now, having one, if having one was not bad enough, having both of them combined is even worse. As you see on the left side of the screen, having albumin to creatinine ratio and EGFR can increase significantly cardiovascular death. And if you look on the right side of the screen, um, having urine albumin to creatinine ratio with an abnormal EGFR also increases the kidney events. And it's not only just death, this, um, this negative impact carries forward and it even goes all the way to admission and to a socioeconomic burden that is you know, affecting the society and the system altogether. Uh, as you see on the purple graph, the admission rate increases with the uh, advancement of the chronic kidney disease. When we look at the cost, uh, as you see on the right side, the dark blue uh, indicate cost due to admission the light blue on the top is because of the prescription and medications for chronic kidney disease, and the middle blue is outpatient or emergency department. So having patient in the hospital carries a significant uh, cost to the system and a burden to the society. Now, chronic kidney disease management is best managed in a holistic pattern. Yesterday, we were in a sponsored event with cardiologists, the chair of cardiologic society, at the chair of Endocrine uh, Society and uh, Dr. Amun al rahimi from Nephrology Society. It was very interesting collaboration. I think it is uh, you know, history in making to have those three disciplines sit together and try to discuss a common pathway moving forward. Now, as you see, the center is, the patient is in the center and all of these subspecialities, and there are many others who I wasn't able to uh, reflect here, including the, you know, the, di the dietitian, uh, pharmacist, social worker, and so on and so forth. So now we'll try to move on to the target therapy and we'll look at hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes management. And most of these slides are taken from the Kidney, Dis kidney Disease International Global Outcome, Improvement Global Outcome, Kidogi, or from the Chronic Kidney Disease Guideline from the NICE. In regard to hypertension, we do have two numbers, which is good because remember, you have to individualize the therapy to the patient age and comorbidities. The Kidogi guidelines are a bit strict, expecting a blood pressure less than 120. However, the NICE give you a little bit of leeway of 140 uh, to 130. 
We all know the importance of the use of angiotensin receptor blockers, the renal study, and the INDTN study, which both showed improvement in the outcome with the use of ASNR. Now, we all uh, understand the complication of using this drug, which is the hyperkalemia management. That's why your therapy should be tailored or targeted toward maximizing the dose, but keeping an eye on the potassium level. So if everything is okay and the potassium level is okay, keep increasing the dose till you get to a satisfactory um, uh, result. If there's hyperkalemia, review uh, and you consider using binders, which we're gonna get into in a minute. And if the creatinine significantly drop or you have persistent hyperkalemia, you might need to stop and review or possibly change. However, the introduction and the importance of treating hyperkalemia, I think, has allowed us all to get a bit more comfortable with increasing doses of uh, ACE and ARBs. Therapy, as you know, is divided into acute management for hyperkalemia and chronic therapy. And with the introduction of the binders, things are much better. I'm not going to go through the details and the comparison between the drugs, but what's important to keep in mind is, please, let's try and forget about uh, sodium um, K-exalate. It doesn't work and it's of no value. However, if you look at the two agents, I would like to just point out to you the dosing. Again, we possibly under-treat patients, especially when we talk about sodium zirconium. I have noticed it's not popularly used. It's a good drug. I think people are scared of the fact that it does contain sodium, which is a true concern because if you were to give a 10 milligram TID, that is more than two, um, two, milligram, two grams per day, which is close to what CKD patients are allowed per day. Uh, mode of action and sorry, onset of action is quite also important to differentiate both. But remember, none of them is designed for acute hyperkalemia management. You still have to use your insulin, your shifting strategy, and so on and so forth. What about ACE and ARB in CKD stage four or five? Uh, so there was a study which is called STOP ACE, renin angiotensis system inhibition in advanced chronic kidney disease. The bottom line is uh, by stopping higher mortality and no benefit in improving EGFR by stopping it. There was also a, a post hoc analysis, which again concluded that RAS inhibition in patients with advanced and progressive kidney disease um, better be continued and not to be stopped unnecessary. We move on to the uh, lipid management, trying to help our cardiologist colleagues with deciding about anti-lipid agents. So uh, if GFR above 60, that is CKD stage uh, one to two, we treat with statin, evidence is 1B. GFR less than 60, uh, but not yet on dialysis. They should be treated with statin or a combination, and that's 1A. When we talk about stage five uh, or dialysis, there is no reduction in the risk of cardiovascular event, and it's not recommended in those patients. So it doesn't mean that we're gonna stop it, but we don't start it. And as you know, most of those patients do end up into nephrology service already on one of those agents. Now we get to the uh, meaty part of the study, or I should say the sweet and sticky, the diabetes management here. So SGL2 T2 inhibitor is the new kid on the block, and we know how it works, but what I want to highlight is the idea that sodium delivery increases to the macula densa, a specialized group of cells in the distal cobulated tubule. They start sensing high sodium, they release adenosine, um, and, and this causes afferent arterial constriction which basically reduces the blood flow into the glomerulus. And this, as you can imagine, result in lower filtration, which is the drop in GFR. And, and at the same time, that's the desirable effect we want, which is to reduce the intraglomerular blood pressure. High blood pressure inside the glomerulus lead to damage, and which we want to slow down and prevent so that patient can last longer before getting to dialysis. Study that we all know of, I think by now it's been beaten to death more over and over again, the DAPA study. We know the result was, was uh, the study was stopped early due to overwhelming efficacy. And as you see the slides, I'm sure for the interest of time, we'll just skip through them. The IMPA study, again, uh, was a very important study with a significant rate of risk reduction. And, um, and what is, I think, more practical to discuss is the precaution with prescribing SGLT2 inhibitor. So dizziness, diabetic ketoacidosis, euglycemic DKA, which is becoming popular. Most of the ER physicians are complaining of seeing those patients. For us in nephrology, we're starting to seeing a lot of UTI, and, and it's very interesting. We had the discussion yesterday, when should you stop the drug? For us in nephrology, we try to stop it after, I think, two times or three but it's important to decipher which one was first. Is 
Is it related strictly to the use of SGLT2 inhibitor or is it a coincidental finding? The idea is it just increases the risk, so you're going to get it. But if the patient keep getting infections, I think it's worth stopping. And this is what we talked about, which is the desirable drop in the GFR up to, a 30, up to 30%. More than that, I think we should stop. But if it's still within that range, continue. That's what we're looking forward to. Um, another good thing to leave your patient with is a six-day protocol or a prescription. Or for those working in hospital, what about a pre-op management and consultation? So uh, if they are feeling unwell or there is a lot of sweat or excessive alcohol intake, um, we should consider holding the drug to prevent volume depletion. If they're going for a day case procedure, to withhold the drug on the day. Uh, if they have other uh, you know, procedure, surgery require one or more day in hospital to withhold the drug. And, and most of the time, most nowadays, all of the acute kidney injury cases we see, we do find patient on SGLT2 inhibitor, and that's the first drug we stop. But it's very important to remember to restart once they're stable. Uh, this is what we talked about is that, you know, with the drop in the GFR, you need to make sure that they are volume replete. So if there's low volume, low blood pressure, stop it. The uvelimic with normal blood pressure, reduce and monitor. If everything is okay, no dose adjustment is needed. So now to summarize the SGL22 uh, in inhibitor um, use in CKD patient and going back to the heat map and the grid, uh, when it comes to the purple box, which is the outside, basically all CKD patient can be treated with um, with uh, SGL2 inhibitor, especially if they have type 2 diabetes or heart failure, and the evidence for that is 1A. If you look at the uh, black box, that is the group which has been studied, again, by both DAPA, mainly by DAPA, sorry. That's the group that should be treated with, um, with, uh, with DAPA, ideally. And if you look at the blue box, that is the group that is studied by EMPA. At the end of the day, we do want to believe that it's a class effect, so don't feel persuaded to choose one over the other, only if you're comfortable with doing that. Now, moving on to a th another group, or a, a second group of medication, which is um, brought to being based on the fact that there is an over, there's overactivation of the mineralocorticoid receptors. Uh, this leads to inflammation and fibrosis, and this leads to progressive kidney damage. People felt like phenylon might be a good drug to add here to stop this process. There are two famous studies you're aware of, the Fidalo study and the Vigaro study, and uh, both had good outcome, and therefore, um, you know, it's, it's, MRA has been used. With MRA, again, the issue of hyperkalemia comes up. If potassium is low, just monitor. If it's in the middle between 4.9 to 5, uh, continue and monitor every four months. If it's high, then stop it or consider using the binder. Obviously, the binder would be the second choice, the best choice to go with. Recently, this study came out, the FLOW trial, GLP-1, and the effect of semaglutide on chronic kidney disease in patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, uh, 3,500 patients randomized with type 2 diabetes and CKD, um, and the follow-up was for 3.4 years. Again, outcome were very positive, 24% uh, risk reduction with semaglutide, 18% lower risk of cardiovascular event or 29 with cardiovascular death, 20 with lower risk of death from any cause in the semaglutide group. Um, and the main annual decrease in EGFR, as you see the slope is there, was significant. So to summarize again this, this, uh, the use of MRA, uh, flow and, and, and FIDELO studies indicate that a lot of the advanced CKD patient can benefit from these two drugs. So, conclusion, or before I go there, people ask this question all the time. Should we start one agent or all four, or what do you recommend? If, if I think I kept the slide where even in the uh, guideline, it is meant to be in a step pattern approach. So far, any of us, especially in nephrology, who try to put patients on the three drugs in one go, unfortunately, um, did not enjoy the outcome, meaning patient did suffer some way or another uh, from developing of acute kidney injury or significant elevation in potassium that uh, was not made it difficult to choose which one is the cause of the hyperkalemia. So I would say always go in a step uh, pattern approach. 
So ASNR and SGLT2 are uh, good in slowing the progression of kidney disease. They do reduce cardiovascular event hospitalization and mortality. Uh, use the maximum tolerated dose of ASNR with the help of the potassium binders. SGLT2 uh, can be used for diabetic and non-diabetic patients as long as they have kidney disease. SGLT2 can now be started at a lower EGFR. Before, most of the studies were talking about 30, but now we're getting a bit more comfortable with using 20. In fact, from yesterday event, and I didn't get the chance to upload the slides, cardiologists, they do have a study ongoing that is uh, addressing or including in it patient with uh, CKD, a CKD patient with EGFR less than 20. Uh, Fearerol reduced the progression of kidney function, impairment, and cardiovascular event in patients with type 2 diabetes and CKD. Semiglutide reduced the risk of clinically important kidney outcome and death from cardiovascular event caused in type 2 diabetes uh, patient with CKD. And this is the graph I was talking about, where first of all, we do focus and do pay a lot of attention to the lifestyle modification. This is quite important. It's not to be underestimated, starting with a healthy diet, physical activity, smoking cessation, and weight management. Then we go to the first line, and as you see, the algorithm is divided into green, which is type 2 diabetes only, and blue, which is type 2 or type 1, meaning those drugs are useful for uh, both uh, cases, type 1 and type 2. So first line, um, so first of all, SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, metformin, that is related to type 2 only, but almost everyone should get RAS inhibitor at a maximum toler tolerated dose. On the extreme right, you have the use of statin, as we discussed earlier. It's quite useful. Uh, the second line would be the use of GLP-1, um, oh, and then next to it would be the non-steroidal uh, MRA, which are quite useful. Um, in the middle of the screen, the, the CBC, uh, which is calcium channel blocker, diuretics as needed, and, and so on. It's quite uh, uh, simple, I think, to follow, and I think for the, I, I would stop here. If there's any questions, I think we'll take them back on. Just remember, binders are your new friends. They are very effective. And as I said, please forget about k -exalate. It doesn't work, and it, it is, it's just what it was, uh, you know, it had it days. Time to move on from now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Ayman.